Will you join me in a word of prayer? Holy God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. <clears throat> I think most of you know that I write my sermons in the middle of the week. I'm not one of those preachers who stays up late on Saturday nights or gets up early on Sunday mornings. But on weeks like this, that doesn't work out. As a preacher, I wrestle with what of the news to bring into Sunday's sermon. We have to grieve the reality that if I rewrote my sermon every time there was a mass shooting and now a natural disaster, we would speak of little else. But when it is here, when we felt the wind and saw the smoke, when we check on friends and families and neighbors and are now walking with them in the aftermath for the nearly thousand folks who lost their homes and their books and their Christmas decorations and their clothes and their toys and their treasures, then we name it. We speak the loss together in this holy space to offer it to God to share the emotions we feel, to share them with God and with one another, and we speak it aloud as a commitment, as our covenant, to respond both in the short and the long term. As I said, I've reached out to our local clergy in the area, and while it will take some time for an organized response effort, we will join with many others in being church, for those who are suffering. Now it might seem strange to then transition to talk about blessings or epiphany, but epiphany is the Sunday we find ourselves on, and the sermon I intended to preach is surprisingly fitting for disaster. Because the epiphany story doesn't fit with what we think or what we believe or assume or expect actually doesn't even fit with what we really want it to be. The reality is way less romantic than the narrative that we lean into. Maybe you noticed as Anne read the scripture that you knew more about this story and she seemed to leave off some of the details. I mean, Anne, why did you skip the part where there were just three, only three wise men? And what about their names? We've heard, we've heard those names, right? You've heard of Balthazar, who came, the king from Ethiopia, and Melchior, the king from Persia, and Gaspar, the king from India, or was it Caspar, the friendly ghost? No, that wasn't in there either. And what about the symbolism of the gifts? I think most of us have heard that in a sermon before. Did, did we just skip that part where it explained that the gold is a symbol of royalty, frankincense a symbol of divinity, and myrrh? a symbol of death. And, and Jackie already gave it away that for some, we think they're in a stable, but it doesn't sound like that. I didn't hear that in the scripture, but they have to be in the stable. They're right there in the nativity, right? They're there in the stable. Of course, I'm not picking on Anne. She did everything perfectly. But much of what we know of this story is not in the scripture. We may want all of these details, but they are not available to us. They have been imagined, and the imagining has come formed into tradition. Now, there's nothing wrong with imagining a bigger story, as long as we remember it is just that, because sometimes even imagining can begin to limit us and doesn't allow us to imagine anew, imagine again. For instance, nowhere does it say that the wise ones, when you look at the text, were only three, nor does it say that they were only men. Throughout the centuries, the traditions have formed and grown, but what we started with was more mystery than explanation. And somehow all the time and energy spent on what we didn't really know has overshadowed what we do know. These wise ones came from the East, which means they were not Jewish. They were Gentiles. Now that's important because Matthew is writing primarily to a Jewish audience and here right at the beginning of his gospel he's telling his readers that this story does not belong to anyone or any one people. 
It is bigger than me or you and Jesus' lineage or any tradition that has formed. The Gentiles, the outsiders, find their way to Jesus, to the Christ child. And when they do, they are welcomed in. It made me think of what I have or really haven't seen or heard in the last 72 hours. I have received multiple contacts in addition to those I've seen on social media where people are offering their homes for those who lost their homes in the fire. While they rebuild or figure out what's next, people are sending me pictures of their guest rooms and letting me know what the circumstances are, that they have rooms to offer and would welcome people in if they need it. But in all of those offerings, and I've seen many, and I've received many, many from you, not one of those offerings specified, they are welcome to use my room as as long as they vote the way that I do. Not one. Even in this insanely divided time, what matters was that people are hurting and that people want to help. And the best situation is that we find a way toward each other regardless of all the other things that usually keep us apart. But finding our way is not always easy, even with the best of intentions. The wise ones knew a little about navigating, but they did need help as well. What we do know about them is that they paid attention to the stars, but they were not looking, nor did they ask to see the Bethlehem star at its rising. But when it happened, they chose not to look away. And so they followed, and they used every resource at their disposal to do so which included trusting the skies, stepping out in the shadows, as I said a few weeks ago as we began Advent, but they also stopped to ask for directions, which really opens the door for a great joke about how it obviously couldn't have just been men, but I'll refrain from going to that stereotype. It is worth noting, though, that they did ask for help. Even these wise ones were not sure where the star was leading them, and so they asked. They might not have asked the best, but they asked Herod, and while he didn't answer out of the kindness of his heart, he did call upon scribes and priests who turned to the scriptures to find the way for the wise ones to continue on their journey. And then, even after they made it to the Christ child, these wise ones continued to be open as they heard in a dream not to return by way of Herod. It is a beautiful thing, really, if you think about all that these wise ones did to make this journey. They looked at the stars, they read, and they studied, they asked for help, they turned to scripture, they trusted the spirit even of their dreams, and all along were willing to take not only the journey there, but the journey home a different way. As I said, today is Epiphany Sunday, and just like the story of the wise ones, we also get wrong what an epiphany really is. We usually think of it as an aha moment that happens to us and to us alone, a moment of clarity or understanding out of thin air like magic. But note that nothing in this story just happens. The wise ones were watching the stars they studied before and after seeing the star. And their epiphany came not in seeing the star at its rising, but by taking what they were given and pursuing it with all available resources. And that is how, after, as Jackie mentioned, two years, they found their way to Jesus. And that is how we find our way to Jesus as well, regardless of the time frame. My original intent for this morning's message was to name the most basic thing that has become so painfully clear this week, that we don't always get to choose the journey that we are on. And so as weird as it is to quote myself, that sermon said, as we set out into this new year, we do not know what it will give us. We do not know what we will receive. It might be a raise or a diagnosis. It could be COVID or a cure to what has ailed us. It could be a new relationship or the end of one. We do not know if society will heal or rupture, where we will see God or where God will feel absent. 
we don't like to say it out loud, but we are not in control. Yeah, that seems silly to say out loud, because watching our neighbor's houses burn to the ground with hurricane winds made this all so obvious. But the reason I wanted to say this today originally is because we spend so much of our time focused on what we can do, the choices that we get to make. And I'm sure that's true of most people. We take responsibility for that which we can, but I think it's especially a thing with us. It might be just the Kirk's personality or a UCC thing. We have a very independent mindset. We value our choices. We value consent, which is naming our choices. Yet in this sacred space, we also need to speak the truth that we don't always get to choose. I watched, as I'm sure many of you did, an interview on the news with a man who said, I just woke up this morning like any other day, and then a while later I saw some smoke, and then now everything has changed. He lost his house. He didn't choose to have this be his story, this suffering, this loss. He didn't even live in the mountains. I mean, it is beyond imagining that a neighborhood would burn to the ground in December, no less. We know this, but we rarely admit it. We want to chart our own path, know where we are going, and find the quickest and best route to get there. But that's just not how it works, regardless of the apps on our phone. A few years ago, I read in a novel a line by John Green that said, you think you're the painter, but you are the canvas. In a podcast, he said more about this, explaining that we don't really get to pick the painting for our lives, which is true, of course, but hard to hear at the same time. I think that's so much of what is wrong or misguided or even damaging about the way our society uses that word blessed that we've been talking about. We think those people with a painting that has the metaphorical white picket fence and sunshine and flowers just painted it that way, and we somehow forgot to. But that's not how it works. We don't get to pick our painting. Our painting happens to us. But I appreciated Green went on to say, we do get to some extent to pick the frame. We do have some choices when it comes to frame our experience, how to find meaning within our experience. We don't get to pick the painting. In fact, this is so hard for us to accept that many theologies argue that if we have to admit that we don't get to pick the painting, then we must understand God as the one picking the painting for us, and we call that predestination. And so the idea then somehow becomes that the closer we are to God, the closer we get to actually picking the painting for ourselves, which is what we wanted anyways. Again, where we get this idea of blessed, this idea of being favored by God, but just like the story of the three kings, that's not what the Bible offers us. An epiphany is not the times when everything goes the way you want it. An epiphany is when everything has gone wrong and you still know that God is with you. When you are in utter despair and a spark of hope has not gone out. An epiphany are all the people who have lost everything, and yet they are offering gratitude that their families were unharmed. Now, that doesn't take away the pain, but it allows our faith and our community and our resilience to frame the painting we were given. And so as we step into a new year, we will continue a tradition that is not in the Bible, I'll admit that, but we have done for a few years— the tradition of receiving a star word. This is a word to guide you into this year as the star guided the wise ones, and they weren't exactly sure where they were going, but they continued to study and read and ask and listen. In years past, I have invited you to choose one, but in the spirit of what we know to be true in 2020 and 2021, but really long before that, we don't always get to choose. It's one of the greatest challenges of life to surrender ourselves to that which is beyond our control. The wise ones didn't choose where the star would be or how they got there. All they knew is that it would lead them to Jesus. 
And so in the same way John is handing out star words to those of you who are in the sanctuary, he's not digging around picking the perfect one for you. He's just going to grab one and hand it to you. You're not going to have time to pick through and say, this is the one I want. So the resolution, New Year's resolutions can happen, but this is a little different. And for those of you who are online, in a few minutes after the sermon, if you, during our prayer station time, if you just post your name, I will grab one out of the basket and offer that to you and then put it in the mail to you as well. So when you receive your word, it might not be anything close to the one you would have chosen for yourself. If that is the case and you find another word you want to guide you, choose that too, but also hold on to this one. And as you have that word with you in the days and weeks and year to come, because it's for this whole year, take time to look it up. There's a Bible verse on it. It's in the Bible other places too. You can look up other places in the Bible. Study it. Look it up in the dictionary, even if you think you know what it means. Ask others what it means to them and what it might mean for you. And listen to your dreams and your prayers and allow this word to unfold in your life throughout this year. Not because you chose it, but because you received it. We make meaning out of what has been given to us. We learn in it and from it and with it. So for the star you receive and for the year we receive, for all that will happen, for the colors added to our canvas this year, may we know or maybe we discover or maybe just pursue God along the way. This journey is long. You don't have to have it all figured out as you go. We will walk together. Amen.